Well, I think um, um, Ralph and I have agreed that we're going to um, shorten this last um, um, 30 minutes substantially, but there are a few things that um, each of us wanted to say um, by way of um, reflecting on what we've heard today. <clears throat> and so starting off, I, I'd like to say, first of all, that I really um, appreciated the tendency of, of everyone in the room through your comments um, uh, to drift back from the, from the purely methodologic uh, toward um, what are the ultimate needs of patients and, and, and to some extent to other decision makers. To Sandy's comment, I, I really thought I heard reflected um, throughout the day uh, that um, despite the fact that we're talking uh, uh, methods, uh, we're here for supporting decision making. I'll just say I think this might be the first PCORI meeting, uh, PCORI co-sponsored meeting ever where we didn't actually invite patients. We just didn't feel like doing it to them. You know, it just didn't, uh, <laughs> it just seemed um, um, like there wasn't equipoise there about whether it would be good, good uh, outcome. Um, the second was it, was it was really great to hear several times uh, uh, that in, in, in the view of some at least, um, uh, observational studies and, and randomized uh, trial uh, methods are converging. I, I think I heard that uh, from Miguel, despite the fact that he said you were crazy if you didn't um, prefer trials. Uh, but um, uh, he also said uh, bring some observational methods into the trials, while others were saying bring some of the characteristics of, of trials into observational studies. Um, <clears throat> very happy to see the uh, continued appreciation of uh, instrumental variables and, and the fact that it does seem to be that, that um, we're moving on uh, somewhat beyond, yeah, but it's hard to find a good instrument and, and I, I really appreciated the discussions in, in that um, arena. Um, also just want to say appreciate from PCORI um, the, the uh, I, and I hear this everywhere we go, this, the genuine concern that, that uh, and, and the willingness to help uh, PCORI get it right, uh, you know, to what should we solicit, what should we fund, um, much appreciated. Um, <clears throat> and as Steve said, it, you know, Steve reminded you, but it, you could always tell people we're not talking so much from the research they do, but from genuinely from what they saw needed to be done. And then um, uh, I just have to make a couple comments about um, the conversations about treatment heterogeneity. Rich. Uh, expressed some surprise at, at how sanguine people were about it, and I interpreted it a, a little differently. I didn't think they got to, is this going to be difficult or not? Is it going to be challenging or not? Uh, so much as just that the time has come indeed to, uh, to look at this, that, uh, uh, and this is different than it was 20 years ago. I feel like I'm in a room with a um, um, number of pioneers in the evidence-based medicine movement, if you will. The evidence-based medicine movement has had great successes. But uh, I hear now, I'm a little bit surprised how to a person I hear that, um, I, I use the phrase the tyranny of the average earlier today, but I heard it echoed many times um, that it is indeed time to really begin turning our attention to differences among people. And it, it, um, I was struck by the fact that when evidence-based medicine first came on the scene, the only people that were saying yes, but patients are different. Were the, were the clinicians who were getting guidelines handed to them. It is striking that we've come around to that point of view that patients are different, treatment needs to be individualized. Physicians said in, in the late 1980s, that's my job, that's, that's what I do, I take a look at individual patients. So uh, two things are true, evidence-based medicine has driven uh, remarkable improvements in, in care and outcomes, and there was a grain of truth in what physicians said in 1986, and we're getting around, I think, now to studying that. And, um, um, <clears throat> Uh, the last couple points, I've just, um, I, I, I do think that uh, among other things, as we, as we look further into the, uh, the question of treatment heterogeneity and, and how to analyze it, I, I really do, I can't get away from the fact that I think there's a lot to be learned about innovation and, and drug development. Drug development, also program development, system, at the system level program development. So um, at Kaiser Permanente, we kept doing these system interventions and they'd always get to about 75%. You get, you know, you, you just hit a brick wall at 75 or 80 percent performance and there was this 20 percent for whom your system did uh, intervention absolutely didn't work and it was, these were different patients. They, they were patients who experienced disparities in a lot of ways. So um, I, I definitely think there's a future uh, and I hope PCORI contributes to studying that and um, last, very last thing to be said there, people said it a little bit, they didn't say it enough and it does tie back to systems I think. 
Um, if we get serious about this, it really is going to take very large data. And so I, 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 I hope that uh, our initiatives contribute to, to beginning to um, create the size of data, the size of trials, as well as observation studies that support serious looks at uh, heterogeneity. So thank you very much, and I will turn it over to my co-chair. Actually, before I begin my remarks, I thought I would ask Claudia whether the uh, refreshments are here, because that would influence just how long I spoke. Uh, <laughs> So um, we'll I, I did learn that uh, refreshments are here, so I will try not to speak quite as long as I might otherwise. Um, so a number of years ago, uh, when the coronary drug project was analyzed uh, for uh, the impact of adherence on the outcomes of uh, treatment, uh, it was done because the overall results of the trial, as you may recall, were uh, disappointingly negative. Uh, treatment uh, in the coronary drug project did not prolong survival compared to the group that had been randomized to placebo. And so the um, investigators did an analysis by adherence, and they learned uh, that those who were highly adherent to treatment uh, had lower mortality during follow-up than those who were poorly adherent. And then they compared it to, uh, did the same analysis in the placebo group, found that those who were highly adherent to placebo had similar reductions in mortality compared to those who were poorly adherent in placebo. Uh, it tells us a lot about the influence of adherence, doesn't it? But the conclusion that was drawn was that adherence was a test for bias, not for efficacy. And in an editorial that accompanied that paper, uh, that was called Counting and Attributing Events in Randomized Trials, the point was made that we should not uh, ever compromise on validity. They said that. Validity was a non-negotiable demand of clinical research. And if something was not um, inherently, intrinsically valid, then the issues of generalizability and efficiency did not apply. So one of the things that I took away from today, uh, and uh, you may wish to uh, assail me on this, but I think that there is a willingness to compromise uh, on that uh, point. I think that there was a strong feeling that uh, the accuracy of results uh, inside the trial and the accuracy of the results outside the trial for whom the treatment might be given are both important. And uh, the issue uh, that was addressed early in the day around bias reduction and bias minimization and the issues that were addressed in the second session on generalizability complemented each other because they were driving towards this issue of trying to get the results, the treatment correct, not just on the basis of who was in the trial, but who uh, might receive the treatment but is outside of the trial. And so um, I wonder whether if we were to write that editorial today, we might write it with a different sense of the balance between uh, validity on the one hand, as we traditionally refer to it, and generalizability on the other. A second uh, broad take-home message I had uh, was that, uh, that I think Miguel is absolutely right to want one of those t-shirts that says that every randomized trial is an observational study on day two. Certainly, every long-term uh, uh, follow-up study uh, that, that experiences the kinds of influences during follow-up that um, occur in real world experience, even in the unreal world experience of randomized trials, and which are well emulated in the observational experience, uh, observational studies that we've been discussing today. So I was very uh, taken with, and I hope uh, one of the things that we will continue to discuss are what, uh, whether the methods of analysis for observational studies and randomized trials, what are the circumstances under which they should be the same? And what are the circumstances under which they clearly uh, are different? And I think it is driven in large part, as he suggested, by uh, the questions that are being asked. Thirdly, I thought uh, the comments that came from the audience, uh, from the participants uh, in the, uh, our discussion, that said, you know, it's the information from patients that we need, not the information from doctors. 
and that it is not likely that EMRs are going to substantially advance uh, our work, at least the way EMRs are currently constructed, was an enormously important observation from, uh, from my perspective. And I think it's something, again, that will have uh, real uh, important implications for how PCORI goes about its uh, business. Uh, this notion that we should invest so much hope in EMRs as the uh, way in which to solve many of the problems that we currently encounter in trying to learn about uh, effectiveness as uh, medicines are used uh, in, in the real world, I think needs uh, considerable uh, reconsideration. Uh, Rob Califf, uh, is Rob still here? Uh, Rob left, but Rob reminded us when he referred to the ISIS trial that astrology is not a good way to identify subgroups, <laughs> right? But we knew that, didn't we? Biology, on the other hand, may well be a good way to identify uh, subgroups, and we are just really at the beginning of that uh, process. But the other thing that we know from a lot of uh, very elegant work that has gone on over the last decade is biology will be insufficient. It will be insufficient. Uh, and so those wonderful studies by Lou Stout, uh, looking at diffuse large B cell lymphoma, uh, uh, identifying uh, through microarray analyses uh, molecular subtypes that had different long-term prognosis, uh, also showed that he could, their team could, much more perfectly describe the clinical course and outcome of patients by integrating clinical characteristics with biology. And they've gone on to try to refine that further, but even that is likely to be insufficient because I think Mary Charlson reminded us that social and behavioral and environmental factors also contribute substantially to the evolution. And that's, again, where, where uh, observational research may bring a really fresh way to examine uh, these kinds of uh, questions that are so fundamental to understanding uh, the long-term uh, uh, outcomes of patients. I would um, uh, try to persuade my colleague, uh, Dr. Selby, that even socioeconomic status, even uh, behaviors in diet, get under the skin somehow to cause uh, differences in outcome, and that there is a biological uh, basis for the impact that social factors and biological factors have on outcome, so that biology will be more broadly described and create uh, a greater uh, uh, understanding of uh, uh, what it means for uh, clinical care. Uh, I uh, was grateful to, uh, to Mark Latke for taking a real stab at individual prediction. So, you know, the uh, strategy that he used of the predicted uh, uh, outcomes for patients uh, in uh, each of the two treatment arms, I think, was a step uh, really forward, and I uh, admired that and thought it was uh, really enormously helpful. And finally, the last uh, comment I would make uh, concerns missing observational studies. Uh, we need to find them. Uh, I thought that the uh, uh, suggestion that somehow we need to create a, a requirement, an expectation, that there is a way of uh, monitoring the, uh, the performance of observational research and the conduct of, um, of protocol-driven analyses is absolutely essential. If we don't have it, we'll never uh, be able to address the, uh, the uh, uh, rightward skew problem that uh, Patrick uh, illustrated so nicely in, uh, in his work. Uh, I would just conclude by saying that uh, I think when Joe and I had that uh, initial meeting, we were, uh, uh, we were enormously excited about the prospects, and then, I don't know whether he felt this way, but there were many times during the planning process when uh, uh, things worried me greatly, and I wondered whether anything, uh, we were going to get all these people together and disappoint them. I, I was not at all disappointed today. I thought uh, the discussion was just terrific. I'm grateful to everyone here who participated in it. And tomorrow, tomorrow, individual risk prediction. Will, uh, will be the focus of discussion. You don't want to miss that conversation. <laughs> so please get here on time. Breakfast will be outside uh, waiting for you, the usual elegant breakfast that is served here for meetings. No, we're in a different room. Uh, Claudia? Yeah. And when, as you come in, the, 
they'll direct you to the uh, right location. Uh, there's refreshments outside. Uh, please enjoy them. Talk to one another, and we'll see you tomorrow morning.